Good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is uh, William Villalongo. I'm the Associate Professor uh, at Cooper Union. Um, and thank you all for coming to our fall 2020 Alex Katz Chair Lecture. Uh, I, among uh, many hats uh, at Cooper Union, I have the distinct uh, pleasure of recommending uh, the Alex Katz Chair each semester. Uh, the Alex Katz Chair was founded in 1999 by the School of Art with generous support by alumnus Alex Katz. The chair provides a one semester visiting professorship to a distinguished artist working in the field of painting and drawing. Uh, Alex Katz actually supports two visiting artists courses in the painting area, uh, which allows our students to interact with new voices every semester. Uh, and I was informed Alex uh, may be in the audience tonight. Uh, so um, I'd like to say special thank you to you uh, for your uh, necessary and generous support uh, to Cooper Union. Our Alex Katz chair this fall is Amy Silman. Uh, Silman almost needs no introduction. Amy is a New York based artist uh, whose many accomplishments include her curatorial project, The Shape of Shape, part of mu the Museum of Modern Art's Artist Choice series, One Lump or Two, a survey exhibition of the artist's work curated by Helen Molesworth, which traveled nationally and internationally. Uh, and her most recent and critically acclaimed exhibition, Twice Removed at Gladstone uh, Gallery in New York, which just came to a close. Silman's work, uh, writing and curatorial projects have been a major contribution to conversations in contemporary art and painting for over 35 years, particularly in the evolving notions of abstraction. Further adding to this is Silman's newest book, Amy Silman, Amy Silman Faux Pas, Selected Writings and Drawings, uh, published by After Eight Books, um, a book of the artist's own writing. Um, with that, uh, I want to welcome Amy Silman. Hi, thank you so much, um, Will, for that super kind introduction. I actually want to just give you a very personal heartfelt thank you from the bottom of my heart for inviting me to the Alex Katz chair position this semester. It's literally saved my life having this experience with talking to my amazing class and having these great, um, you know, exchanges and being at these conversations with colleagues and people in the community. So I'm really honored and I want to thank Alex Katz. Um, if, if you're out there, Alex Katz, thank you so much. Your support is amazing. And thank you to Adriana and Mike and Sam and everyone in the office who's been so helpful. And I didn't know how to use Outlook or Microsoft. So thanks to the tech people. And thank you from the bottom of my heart to my class, uh, who has literally filled me with joy and, and interesting this, you know, conversations and amazing um, exchanges. Um, all this whole during the pandemic and this crazy time that we've been going through. I'm really grateful to everyone there. And I think gratitude is um, important to express first. So I really appreciate it. Um, I'm gonna talk, I'm gonna um, not go over the time, but I decided uh, a couple of days ago that I, I was gonna begin with a statement of my first principles. I'm gonna call them first principles. And so I'm gonna, um, the principles as I wrote the text and the talk and as the images came along with it, um, I realized that like, wow, I'm such a school mom. It's like a Bible of like, beliefs and things that I want to impart and things that I want to cite and uh, ancestors to my work and influences and sources and heroines and heroes and just stuff in my backyard, maybe. So before I show you my um, kind of little romp through some of my work, first, I want to really honor a bunch of traditions. And I really want to say some things out loud that will maybe help unpack the work that I'm going to show after that of my own. Um, so bear with me. I'm going to first share my screen and get this PowerPoint going. 
So some of my first principles that I've brought with me since the 70s, process, touch, body knowing, doubt, negation, improv, accident, chance, difficulty, humor, the personal is political. It's, this is not all of them, but I'm gonna just start up. And first we'll listen for a minute. Oh, Seventies art practices, experimental dance, film and performance, Judson Church dance, contact improv, PS122, 8 BC, the Bird Hoffman School for Birds, embodiment, chaos, drawing as diagram, drawing as thinking, the ancient sense of touch still alive, and thinking as touching, stroking, patting, nudging, touches tenderness and its immediacy, its way of being like writing, like code, like messages, the idea that process is how you develop form, and that process is a living experiment, corporeal like walking or breathing, the idea of a personal performative space, actions made maybe even absurdly just to find out the shape of your own thought. The idea of a studio, not as a factory for products, but as a lab for trying things out, contemplating like a library is for scholars. And that involves work, labor and uncertainty. In this way of making, the work is seen as formed while forming, being both a splitting and a unifying of your mind and your body as you look at your own hand or arm forming the forms. The work is not divided between concept and material, not even between up and down, wall and floor, but is an actual medium, a bridge between knowing and doing. And I'm defining a medium as any space you create for thinking, including the page, a rough space, a cave space, a palpable space where you work through things as they come into being, the idea of not dividing the work into thought versus action, not walling things off, but the medium itself as embodied thinking, body knowing, a speaking body. This can be like building up a language. This can be what cognition is, maybe unclear signs, but like a conversation, like a relationship. This can be messy. You do it on the spot, even though you're not sure what you're gonna say next. You're looking for a structure by moving the parts around, but you're building a new language with just the signal to noise ratio with your body knowing. Imagine the female goddess Iris as the medium instead of Hermes, and then imagine what iridescent knowing must be like instead of hermeneutics. In this way, process is related to wisdom. Two, the principle of doubt. Doubt in philosophy, doubt in literature, doubt in theology, and in aesthetics. Doubt as fundamental to touch, to the sensation of drawing, of painting, the kind of painting where you make constant changes, where nothing remains fixed. Doubt is about knowing, with feeling, agonizing, not being absolute, being incalculable, a painting that says, I don't know, or I wonder, but recognizes a shimmering space of the possible, the potential, or even the absurd understanding that the shimmer and the absurd are connected, that anxiety is connected to knowing, that the etymology of understanding has to do with being split open like a piece of fruit, being pierced, perforated or opened, letting light in, knowing that knowing involves being opened or perforated, a process of feeling your way through. Note, in this way, doubt is related to sensuality. Three, the principle of negation, 
not just in theory or analysis or ideas, but in knots, problems, urges, as a glitch, as an objection, or picturing problems with no solutions, or annihilation, doublethink, being a refusenik, saying no to the art world or anyone in it, or stating a whole list of your limit conditions, your boundaries, your refusals, defining your own culture, just wiping things out, making nothing out of something or something out of nothing, or just erasing everything. In this way, negation clears the way for affirmation. Three, the principle of improv, the stroke, the gesture, the opposite of playing from a written score, but instead working the nerves in the heat of the moment in response to others, the aesthetics of the nervous system, the limbic system, and that includes the downbeat, a syncopation, or harmelotics, the surprise of seeing color moving as either divine or as mundane, everyday stuff, garbage, camouflage, the making of lists, piles, messing around and blowing up small things into phantasms, or just scribbling on the paper while listening to the news, just a regular person who breathes, walks around and responds, dealing with the world and its junk, its everyday stuff, maybe both social and antisocial. In this way, improvisation can be structured. Four, the principle of accidents, chance operations, the principle of ugliness, awkwardness, the id, the unconscious, limping verse, unfinishedness, painting as impure, just a series of adjustments, moods, an awkward embrace, an accidental meeting of systems and certainty, finding that you're in a relationship with an art project that asks you questions, being knocked off kilter by the glitch in your system, or finding a safe space where you can refuse to assimilate, where you define your own standards, or drawing from your own model aesthetic, cultivating your own scene, making inside jokes for your own audience, inventing, oops, at inviting the people, sending political signs to the people you need to reach, inviting jokes, inviting cryptic messages, inviting your own audience, and inviting a code that you send out to only the people who need to reach those signals. In this way, the principle of accident is very purposeful. Five, the principle of difficulty, declaring the difficulty of being a citizen or being a subject, declaring the right to be opaque, having scrappy aesthetics, trying to figure it out in your underwear, wrestling with the materiality of the world with your bare hands, using anything you have, your spirit animal, a camera, melodrama, TV, sentiment, to form your own scrappy aesthetics, trying to figure everything out, stretching rhetorics and grammar to unfurl in time and space till it means something new, to diagram, to chronicle the whole world, to write and draw as simultaneous interpretation, crossing all boundaries, using everything, working in the margins, using scraps, using envelopes and fragments, using language as material and art made into language, to define your own shapes, your shadows, your silhouettes, your affections, and your decorations, finding structures within yourself in order to change outer structures, to mess things up, things that flood, they won't stay in their place. They cross the media again. Painters who work like filmmakers and filmmakers who become painters to adopt the wrong medium as your model, to use experimental film video as a model for painting, like shooting freely first, then editing into meaning by assembling parts later, using sequence, using duration, accumulation. In this way, difficulty is also legibility. Part six, the principle of humor, funny things, dumb handmade stuff, DIY culture, comic books, bedroom productions, private dances, folk art, fantasies, art made as gifts, political satire, tragedy in cartoon form, protest in cartoon form, anguish in cartoon form, painting from your own spaces, sometimes outsiders, 
who don't necessarily want to come in, sometimes insiders who want to be out, de-skilling as reskilling, fast painting, unfinished painting, bad painting, low culture, pop songs, irony, shabbiness, sexiness, camp, drag, satire. In this way, humor is also liberation. And finally, the personal is political, which was a 70s motto, but could apply to all kinds of identity politics to implicate yourself in your work, your own body and subject position, recognizing the subject is nested in context, politics and histories, both inside and outside, being willing to say that out loud in streets and in hospitals and in homes. The idea of care, to portray yourself and other with care. In this way, the personal is related to ethics. How you treat people, no matter what your rhetoric is, how generous you are, how you channel your feelings and thoughts, how you make your forms and colors with touching feelings and making work with feelings touching. And in this way, the personal is related back to the tactility of painting. So that's my, those are my principles. Now I'm kind of going into this um, sort of zone of, uh, well, wait, I got to get a, uh, there we go. I have um, a, a clock in front of me now. I'm going way back. First, I just want to show you some teeny things that just set out some principles. When I was um, starting to make art, I made it, I started, I went to school in the 70s. And in the 80s, I just worked very quietly for a decade. I graduated in 79. And, and for most of the 80s, I really wasn't showing, wasn't working in a public way at all, wasn't hanging out with painters or artists that much. I was mostly hanging out with filmmakers and poets and um, people who had kind of quit art after like studying critical theory or getting, I don't know, getting, getting AIDS or, or getting, you know, becoming political, uh, becoming activists or becoming philosophers. People were kind of dropping out. As you probably know, painting wasn't cool in the 70s. I mean, in the 80s, it, was, it, was, it wasn't a, a, an okay thing to do. We can talk about that later if you want. But I was basically always working on this project that I think is in a sense about intimacy. And I was making huge pieces, but with tiny, tiny details. I mean, what you're seeing now is probably three times bigger than what this drawing really was. So I was taking these tiny moments and these little instances of like fragmentary uh, uh, diagrammatic um, moments of, of, of narrative that wasn't finished and, and dream or thought uh, or, or sentence or word that wasn't woven together. And I was enjoying the openness and the, and the unfinishedness of these parts, but I was trying to always figure out a structure for them coming together. And a long, long time ago, I think this was probably at least 22 years ago at this point, I was um, coming up with, because of my love of sequence and books and film, I was, I was drawn to a, an idea of a horizontal format, a kind of in a way, animation without the um, technicality of animation. I didn't really know how to do animation, but I knew how to put things next to each other. And I started to make these paintings, this was a long time ago, but I started to make these paintings that were structured in different ways. Some of them were grids, some of them were long sequences, some of them were kind of chronicles that um, extended over large pages with little interruptions. And these, um, these, um, these, kinds of works, I saw them as, in a weird way, films or videos or books laid out as paintings. And they had these intimate little details and things that were changing and flickering from one time to the next. Um, I started to make longer and longer um, horizontal formats and they ended up you know, being strung together over long periods of time so that when I did start really showing, which I guess was uh, in the 2000s basically, or in the 90s, but I mean, really like I wasn't showing until the, at least the mid 90s. Um, but by this point, I had sort of built up this idea that I was kind of in a funny way making a scroll. And it was a kind of Gesamtkunstwerk idea made out of tiny intimate details. 
And so the moments were little and the, and the, and the characters, if you wanna call them that, or the figures or the situations or the colors interacted and flickered. And it was kind of like a nonlinear um, animation film of some kind where I thought of it as the person walking around the room as the animation machine and the work itself is just staying still as opposed to when you're in um, a, a, a theater and you're sitting still and the animation is moving. But I was kind of trying to enact a kind of sequential logic every time I made a show and use the space as a kind of staging ground. Sometimes I would literally only put fragments of color or, or one big painting and 20 little paintings. But a lot of the work that I did was about unpacking things across long, unfurling horizontal space. Um, in 2009, I moved to Berlin to live in Germany for a while. And in this show that I had, that was the first show I had in a gallery in Germany, um, I decided you can see that there's like a bunch of big paintings, but this show decided, I decided to combine things in a different way. So you can see on the, on the left side, there's this little table. Oops, I'll go to the table first. Oops, sorry. Here's the table. Um, and I wrote on the wall, I decided that I needed a, um, some kind of translation device because it was the first time I was showing in, a, in, a, in, in, in Germany. And I know that Germany has a very strong um, hi history and tradition and relationship to painting. I didn't want to be mistaken for an abstract expressionist, kind of an abex Maudi or an ab abex you know, second, 15th generation. But I was making these paintings that you see here that were somewhat diagrammatic. They were conceived as being kind of about the idea of what a diagram is in that a diagram holds both space and time, a kind of generous container in which you can kind of put anything you want and the vectors will kind of combine and kind of create this big holder for both moving across time, moving across space, sequence. And it was in a sense a way of sequencing things, but, but keeping them all into the square of the canvas itself. So I was thinking about these kinds of issues of the diagram. And I thought, I need to think about a couple of different ways to propose a diagram. One of them is to just make these paintings. Um, and the other, some of which are made very fast and some of which are made very, very slowly through tons of scraping and erasing and layering. I can talk about that a bit later, but I just wanted to say that I was also living in an academy that had invited me to live there for a year, uh, the uh, American Academy in Berlin, and I was making satirical seating diagrams uh, about the people I was meeting at dinners there. And I was just like messing around during the day and making up fake people. So I, I kind of, I did this so passionately at night that I decided to include these jokes in with my paintings because I kind of thought, what's the difference really between a joke and a painting? And then what's the difference between a diagram and a joke or a diagram and a joke and a painting? or a magazine with an essay in it. In other words, I kind of realized all of a sudden that all of these parts of myself that I hadn't been able to fit into my paintings proper were actually like really important to kind of embed in rooms with the painting. So then I started to really try to include difference as a principle in all of the rest of my shows from that time on. So I would have a show that would be like this. This was a show I had in New York at Sycamore Jenkins, which at the time is, was where I was showing um, in the gallery, I, you know, the gallery I was showing at. I think it was back in 2006 or something. And no, that can't be right, 2010. Um, and um, I had all these big, very um, notably kind of diagrammatic paintings. I wanna stop here for one second, just say, I'm not showing you a whole, I often show like, slides of a painting in, in development in my studio because the paintings sometimes take an hour and they sometimes take a year. And I work like an archeologist where I just keep digging and burying and piling and digging and burying and scraping and pulling and pushing. And I try to figure it out while I'm doing it. If I can get something really quick, I'm really happy and I'll leave it very with pleasure. It's not that I wanna like work hard just for the sake of 
tearing my hair out, but I just feel like I'm in this really intense relationship that is a formal relationship, is an affective relationship, and is a kind of meaning relationship where I can't let the painting go until something happens that makes the painting kind of maybe come together at a higher level that where, than where it started. So a lot of these works take a long time. Anyway, in like this one took, I think, two days. It was hanging next to this one that took, I think, you know, nine months. This one's as thick as an elephant skin. This one looks like it was, you know, you know, washed with, you know, some red at the bare canvas level, and it was. Um, but with those paintings, what I'm trying to get to is that I also started to always include other things that I thought of as kind of friendly sidekicks to paintings. So in this particular um, case, I made a whole series of this kind of chronicle of the life of a light bulb. And the light bulb becomes a flashlight and the flashlight becomes a kind of a, I don't know, a searchlight and the searchlight sort of becomes a, a thing with which to search your body. Then it becomes a, a thing with which to search other bodies. And it was a long series of drawings that I made that I put in with the painting. And in some ways, these structures, you can sort of see like if you kind of go across to like this one, you can see how these kinds of structures actually relate to these kind of paintings. So it made sense to have these things in with the painting because it sort of unpacked them. Then I decided that because it was the story of a light bulb, the whole thing was going to be about Kant and the Enlightenment. And I basically studied Kant for a year and wrote this whole um, chart and diagram about him. But I made the zines and I put them in with the show. And then I started making a zine for every show that I did. And I would always sell it for a, a unit, one unit of currency per wherever I went. So it was either one euro or one dollar or one pound, whatever it was, it was one. And I would ask, um, I would put them in piles in the gallery with the paintings and ask people to basically make an exchange. I just didn't want them taking them free. Anyway, then I got, uh, at some point at this moment, I got invited to a residency where the, in, for another six months where I thought I can retreat and learn how to string these ideas together and try to make some kind of a film made out of drawing, which I did not know how to do. So I'm gonna let this play for one sec. So I'm just gonna talk on top of it now. You can see that the um, technical aspect is pitiful. I mean, I made this like literally with my iPhone, you know, not knowing how to deal with, how to make an animation at, at all. But what it did was it taught me that with this, I'm gonna stop it. Um, I, I, it. What it did was that it taught me that this DIY, um, do it yourself kind of punk, you know, don't know how to play the bass. So then you're in a band kind of atmosphere. Could it apply to the way that I was working with the, these friendly g sort of domestic things that I would embed with my painting. So um, I would, I could draw on my cell phone. Um, I could make an animation of the drawings of my cell phone. I could dump all the uh, parts of you know pictures of drawings and then add a script to it. I could make I could make this lively other part of my work that wasn't painting. Everything I couldn't fit into abstract painting. I could just put it in there. I didn't have to be good at it. I just had to be I had to be passionate about it, and I had to like want this to accompany that. 
So I'm, I'm gonna get back to painting soon, but I wanna talk a little bit about this begin, this way that I started making animation. In this case, I was invited by some wonderful French friends to participate, I mean, to have a show in Paris. And I, they asked me if I wanted to collaborate with this wonderful poet named Lisa Robertson. And so I made an animation on my phone to a poem of hers called um, Split, uh, I forget the title, it's something like, um, uh, notes for a video on split screen, uh, notes for a split screen video. Anyway, I, I literally narrated the poem myself and I made this double-sided thing. I'm just gonna show it to you for a sec. A young woman looks openly out of the picture. A young woman looks openly out of the picture. Her experience of scale is always paradoxical. As for the unconscious, she is breathing in its Latin. Philosophy comes from her having difficulty. Her experience of scale is always paradoxical. When girls were flowers, this wasn't true. Her pronoun is sedition, unrecognized as okay, such. Okay, I'm going to leave it there. I love that. Her pronoun was sedition, unrecognized as such. In any case, I was working with this um, wonderful poet and I started working with poets around this time, which I think was around 2012 or 2011. Um, and I started making um, these printouts of these, um, of these videos and then realizing that I could show these videos, not only embed the zines and drawings and cartoons and diagrams and all the other ephemera that I make with my painting, but I could also have shows like this where I would print out all the stills. Oh, I mean, actually it was only about a 10th of them, but I could print out the stills of the animation and they could be this huge chronicle, this kind of cosmos of like moments, tiny moments, just like I was talking about in the beginning, making a huge thing out of a little thing. And so I started to um, have all these different kinds of shows, different, I did the one in London and I did them all over the place where I would like print out moments and also at the same time um, show, oh, sorry, whoops show uh, show the um, sequences, um, make it clear that these things were to be seen as moments of sequence, but also um, embed these embed these videos into the room with it. So there was something there would be something actually moving. And then, okay, I'm getting back to painting a little bit. I started when I did these pieces, I think you can see it says 13 possible futures for a painting. I was thinking about how paintings are seen as these endpoints. You see them as these big trophy giant, like this is a huge painting that I made and it seems to sit on the wall as, as a kind of final triumphant object that, that has meaning and that we're all supposed to stand in front of and look at. And the way that I had come to think about painting through this long, a detour through like the world of, you know, homemade video was that I had come to think that maybe my videos could propose alternate endings to my paintings. So then I started doing something for a while. I tried doing a thing where I would have a painting show and I would embed the little video of the thing moving with the painting to in a sense kind of destabilize the painting and make it seem like the painting needed the video for something. Um, it wasn't just an aesthetic thing. It was a, an important aspect of how like that painting had other stories buried in it that I, I wasn't going to be able to show in the painting. And it would have, in this case, you know, there were 13 vignettes that came along with the painting on the little iPad screen. So these things to me were like very much about trying to create a circuitry or a situation for painting that that allowed painting to be an incomplete form to have something else to kind of accompany it but also to have the other thing feel like it didn't quite belong but it wanted to be there it would always let painting would always be the primary thing but the secondary thing would be nagging at it there would be a relationship a kind of loving antagonism in the room between the painting and the other the other 
So this is a show that had that in mind, where when you came in, you looked at a long sequence of these half printed, half painted, half spilled and poured kind of images of this repeated form. On the other side of the room, there was a thing that exactly um, mimicked the basic shapes that were outlined in this abstraction, but you would be able to see what all these things were. And it was, I, I wrote it on the wall with chalk. So it looked really ephemeral. So this was literally the key or the putative key. It was basically fake. I, I got these terms by combing through Freud's book, Beyond the Pleasure Principle. It wasn't what I was thinking about at all, but I was interested in the idea that if you looked one way, you would see meaning. If you looked the other way, you would see abstraction, but you could never see them together. They were tantalizingly near each other, but they didn't really unpack each other because you couldn't face them both at the same time. And I was very much thinking about the idea of the subject versus the object. So I made this kind of key and I thought this was really funny and, and this, was, this was a very important um, moment for me in thinking about how to make more of these long horizontal sequences. Um, I went to Austria and I did a project that I was invited to do where they said, you know, do you wanna have a painting show? And I said, well, what if I said yes and no? What if I said, I like negation. What would happen if my paintings were the thing that weren't in this show? And if instead I present everything except the paintings, like a diagram that explains it, a platform for showing it, a book with an interview about me, and even a color scheme, but no paintings. When no paintings are present, then what is produced? Longing, misunderstanding, frustration, relief, comedy? These were questions that I was asking myself. So I built a little pavilion in the, in the, down, in the, in the, in the space, and I had all the things we've talked about, long horizontal sequences, characters, one side versus the other side, a stack of zines that you could take you could put a dollar in the, there were two heads that each had two faces and you could put a dollar, uh, I mean, a, a Euro in, you would hear the Euro drop into the bucket, a ha ha, a pun on a drop in the bucket. And then you would go all the way around the thing. That means put the money in the, um, in the little head, in the, in the change box. Um, and around the back was the actual, a, a set of actual drawings that were actually kind of really beautiful. That was this series of charcoal drawings of these characters that I called mopers, who were these kind of moping, lonely, kind of miserable characters who should be laying in bed, but were set upright. And they were um, a, kind of, a kind of misery index that you could again walk up past and while they sort of changed from abstraction to figuration and back again. And then, you know, this, of course, this kind of art show would change into this kind of strange kiosk when you came around the other side. And then the, 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 the Freud diagram or the anti-Freud or non-Freud diagram was printed and was unfoldable as a, as a leporello. You know, a leporello is one of those long unfoldy things um, that you could, you could get for one euro. So I did that and then I came home and I decided to play with something that I was thinking about more aggressively. Oh, this isn't, this is glitchy. It's not like, that's funny. It's kind of glitching out. Um, I, I wanted to play with this time-based thing using my drawings to make a kind of animation that didn't have, um, a narrative that was really made out of backgrounds and for, and, and, and the kinds of forms and drawings that I would have in my painting. So I had a show, oops, sorry, where I took all of those um, works that, you know, compiled the drawing, I mean, the video that I made, and it was, it was shown together with the video. This was again back in New York, I think it was in 2016. And that, um, these kind of details led into this giant room of these very highly structured paintings, which were very much about um, these were all, almost all very slow paintings, very much about scraping down, building up, archaeologically searching for the sort of subject, the resolution, if there was one, to sort of build the thing into a more interesting structure. These were all, um, when you really see them in real life, deeply, deeply textured, deeply drawn, deeply 
buffed, rubbed, um, scraped, um, sanded. These were very intense handmade surfaces. And the paintings were very much about this kind of um, search for a certain kind of quasi body like structure. In a sense, this was sort of like, to me, it was kind of like legs bending over with arms and maybe breasts hanging down or possibly legs sideways with other legs walking through. It was a kind of sense of space and process of finding place and what felt right you know, in terms of form, all of this totally kind of gut instinctual search. Um, this one was more, more about like uh, faster and more about drawing. But these were like big kind of beautiful paintings that were very much, um, you know, made in a kind of action painting tradition of figuring out what you're doing while you're doing it and finding a kind of rhythm and a kind of, um, a kind of solution for it, like in the process of doing. And in the back room, behind all of that, there was this big um, installation of these panels that I silt screened. They were based on those little ones that I showed you that were in Paris with the key, but they were now like blown up like, you know, 10 times bigger and they were set on these kind of wooden planks. And then I made, I was gonna try to, sorry, I have to skip forward. I, I made that into a, a whole different show that I'm gonna, I'm gonna go backwards. I think I'll show you this first and then I'll go backwards. But I made these, um, I, these big giant versions of those panels that were mounted in a room. This was a show that I had in um, Frankfurt a couple of years ago where you come, this is, this is the best way to see it. You came into the room and on your way into the room, you see a, an animation which relates to the sort of mishaps of this animal and human that are going through kind of a bad time together, kind of a misfired relationship. And all around you, what you're seeing are um, blow ups of these panels, which I had reprinted as the, as the zine. This, sort of, this sounds like really confusing. I don't mean it to be this confusing. This was, the, this was like a little clip from the, um, from the sort of video of mishaps. Uh, where you know you put money in the coin, somebody steals your bucket, your body starts to come apart. Um, you walk towards. Oh, whoops, that was it. Well, more mishaps occur later. But in any case, the whole thing was kind of set up like a a circuitry loop, um, another kind of machine of understanding how painting might work if it were staged as a very complicated problem. So. Um, these things were also posed as paintings, even though in a weird way, they were just, um, um, what do you call them? They were, um, they were prints. Um, they were stained, they were silk screened and they were printed. Um, I'm gonna move forward a little quickly, a little more quickly. I'm gonna skip this show in Berlin. I'm gonna show you a couple of bigger paintings, but I wanna get, this is how I sometimes also hang painting shows where things are in, weird places um, in relation to the room sort of as a kind of unfolding. I, 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 I want to actually come to the last show and so I think I'm going to skip through a couple things so I can just get to it. But this is the score. I just want to show it to you because then I went to Rome and I made a, a video of Ovid's Metamorphosis because with all of the things I'm telling you, a series of mishaps, a chronicle, a long endless chain of events and changes and metamorphoses and unfortunate and fortunate circumstances that keep going endlessly on to the next one. With all of that, I became obsessed when I lived in Rome for a while with Ovid's Metamorphosis, which was a book that was written in, about a, in the year about 100 and whose first line is something like, I want to sing of the body changed. And I was very moved by this. I, 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 I have a lot of friends who are trans or who are interested in an idea of transition, transitioning, transitions and transformations of themselves and of the world. And I thought this book was kind of an amazing chronicle of just the will to change as the subject. So I made a list of everything that changes into the next thing in the whole book. And I skipped all the plot and the narrative and all the stuff about the gods and the goddesses. And I just stuck to like what turns into what. So this was the score. 
and then the the video was um uh, I'm not gonna play the whole thing, but it was about what happened in Ovid's metamorphosis. You can see that my tech uh, went up a little bit, but not very much. I made the whole thing in the bathtub. The drawings were all made in a bathtub so I could spray them with water. And I don't really make know how to use anything like Premiere, so I made it on iMovie. So I'm like terrible at tech. In any case, it led me to more of these long unfurling, unfolding kinds of sequences that I feel like have been important to me since the very beginning, which in a weird way makes it seem like basically what I am is a kind of book artist, which maybe I maybe that's what I am. Um, but I was making these kind of shows that had animations with these troubled people kind of laid out in orders that were interrupted by various forms of abstraction. I think that in a way for me, abstraction is is a kind of form of interruption. And it's a way to kind of interrupt the proceedings of a narrative. And I like to employ it as such. So I was doing things like that. I'm gonna, um, I'm gonna move to some, um, I'm so sorry, this is taking me so long. Um, I did this big show in Camden that had long sequences like this. And also these big paintings that were very much about these kind of um, felt sorrowful, affecting, affective kind of relationships that I have both with the painting and then with the characters in the painting. Um, and I feel like the paintings have everything to do with all of the subjects that, we, that I've talked about in forms that are extrinsic to the paintings, but the paintings have them in those painting terms, um, sometimes in abstract terms and sometimes with figures sometimes and a lot of times with figures and abstraction in a middle place between those two poles. So these are some more of those things. Here's a painting that um, I did, <coughs> sorry, <coughs> right before the most recent work. And I was preparing for a show that was supposed to be last spring in New York. And of course it was the pandemic. So I got about this far. This is a picture of some of the works that I just showed in my um, recent show in my studio and how like I work with them. They're very big, they're 40 by 60 inch drawings. I do them in the way experimental film is made where I, I make them, I put them out. I, I mean, I, I, I don't think about the logic, I'm not strategic. I make each one, I work really hard on it. And then it's in the deployment, it's in the hanging that I figure out the order, which I think is very related to the kinds of editing practices that I learned from experimental filmmakers that I studied with as a kid, as a young person. I just wanna say in between all of that, um, then there was the pandemic. Uh, somehow there was the, pen, I, in between all of this, I curated a show at MoMA. Um, Will mentioned it, it was called The Shape of Shape. It ended up being um, open for a year because it was closed in the middle and then reopened. Actually all the things I'm telling you about, we don't even have to talk about it. Um, but all the things I'm telling you about, all the beliefs that I have about the awkwardness and the embodiment and the, uh, the craziness of like thinking and feeling and wanting things to be affective plus analytic and intellectual, all of this stuff and making connections and using a sense of humor, all of this stuff was in the show, but I don't have time to talk about it. Anyway, then it was pandemic. I was reduced to this as my studio because I came out to this little house I have in Long Island and I didn't have a studio anymore. And I had to make the show for Gladstone that I just had in, I had to figure out how to make the show. So, and write this book, all of which I did during pandemic. Wait, I'm checking the time. It's 726, I gotta hurry up. I made a zine that's 150, 112 pages that's on the MoMA website. I published a book of my writing. I did all this at the pandemic. And then I didn't really have a studio. I just had that kitchen table. So I decided to paint flowers because it was spring. And I literally thought, I don't know if I'll ever see any of my friends again. I don't know what's gonna happen next. And I think like all of us, I was very unsure about whether these were my last paintings or the last months I would see anyone. 
And so I poured a lot of heart and soul into just painting the flowers that were coming up all around me all spring while we were all, you know, hideously uncomfortable uh, dealing with the politics and dealing with the, 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 the virus and dealing with everything else we were dealing with for the last six months. I was painting flowers and I then found a studio and slowly the flowers kind of morphed into back into forms that I would make as an abstract painter in my studio every day. And then those kind of morphages, those kinds of relationships between abstraction and things that I saw that I tenderly drew would start to get played out in lines and sentences, as sentences, as pieces that need each other, as chains. Um, and then there were drawings that were being made where I would change the background but I would let the foreground be the thing that was all, I, I would let the foreground be the thing that was the same. And I would, I would change the background instead of the foreground because I realized I started thinking about figure ground and signal to noise ratio. And I wanted to change the ground, not the figure. That was actually a big and important thing for me to think about during the pandemic. Then I had the show and this is the end of my um, little screen uh, thing. So I'll just click through it really quickly. I think some of, I know that the class came to see it. It was made of the big giant paintings that I made while the pandemic was happening. And then I hung the flowers which were extremely important to me in between around among in a cluster singly all over the room because I felt that these amazing, beautiful, erotic, libidinous, wonderful kinds of colors and forms and life itself were keeping me going. And I wanted them to be hung as little almost memorials or gifts in between the painting. And they relate to the paintings. There would be, you know, here was like a wall of Gladstone and there would be a sequence like this where there would for me be a very strong relationship between the figure of the flower and the figure that was being built up in an abstract painting. Um, there was a wall with a field and a bunch of flowers. Um, I don't know, some of you saw this. And then there was a long cycle of those big drawings in the other room. And so I wanted to stage a kind of very complicated, very rich, very sensual groups, group of ideas and works together. And I wanted it to feel as as, as rich and as dense and as complicated and painful and beautiful as that whole time had been for me in my studio. Um, and it was very much about a lot of the same things I've been thinking about since the very, very beginning. Body parts, awkwardness, sequences, slow and fast, archeology, span meaning, feeling. And um, the drawings kind of led to the back room where there were, other paintings that really ranged from very slow to very fast. The one on the left took a year of painting out, painting out, painting out, painting out. The thing on the right took maybe 15 minutes and they were very important to me and connected. Um, and the final um, painting at the end of the room was this painting that I really thought about signal to noise ratio, which is a kind of idea in sound theory. Um, I wanted, to really embrace what really came forward for me during pandemic was the idea of pattern, how pattern was beauty, was repetition, um, was kind of this almost hitherto for me, almost forbidden kind of pleasure, this ground of repeated signals and repeated weaves and interrupting and cutting into that weave to, to, to have bits of a body that like transgresses and interrupts the, the, the meaning or the, or the wholeness of the pattern and the rupture that's contained in that, in, that inter, in, in that clash, that was so much for me, the meaning of the pandemic. So that's where I'm gonna end. Um, I think I kept that to the right amount of time. It's 7.30, I hope so. Should I stop sharing? It's weird to, please forgive me, but it's weird to do all that and see nobody and nothing. From my uh, point of view, it looked wonderful, Amy. Thanks. Thank you so Thank much. You. Um, so we're going to open uh, this up to Q&A for maybe uh, about 15 uh, to 20 minutes for, uh, for the remainder of our time. So 
those of you who had questions, um, feel free to um, type in your question in the Q&A tab uh, at, the, at the menu tab at the bottom of your, uh, of your browser. Um, there are a couple questions here for you, Amy. Um, one um, is um, pretty practical, um, uh, which is um, uh, audience member wondering about the, uh, your principles and if, if that is uh, somehow published or located somewhere beyond um, your presentation you did, if it, if, it's, if, it, if it was like off the cuff or if it's something that was- Oh, I wrote it for this talk. So there's a text that I have in my computer that I can send you, but I literally spent the last three days or four days like writing, writing it. Um, we, if uh, this is being recorded with, and with Amy's permission, um, it'll be up on uh, the Cooper Union um, um, YouTube site. Um, and the other question was about the, uh, the, the animation and the animation in the, that you were talking about being made in a bathtub. The question is, what guided your choice of audio? How was making the audio different from making a painting? How is it similar? Thank you so much for that question. That's wonderful. Mm. The very first one that I did uh, when I was, I was at the Radcliffe Fellowship in 20, I think 2010, 2011, um, that first one that I showed you a little bit about the sort of story of the light bulb, the flashlight that has that was silent, um, but it's about a it's about a twelve or thirteen minute piece, and I feel like it's very demanding to sit in silence for thirteen minutes. That's what I discovered. I didn't know how to make make a soundtrack, um, and I didn't have anybody to work. And actually, that piece concludes with the death of my brother, uh, which was a, something I was going through then. And so it's actually funny, but really not funny and sad. And I didn't really know how to think about sound. So I just didn't. Um, uh, I, um, I'm not really good at sound. I'm really good at language. Um, I'm horrible at music. So I didn't really have anyone to work with. And also the piece was so rough. It was really like I was a freshman, basically. I was like a you know 58 year old freshman or 55 year old freshman trying to figure out how to make something for the first time, and I didn't know how to do it. Then, uh, when I did a piece with ver various poets, I worked with Charles Bernstein, I worked with Lisa Robertson, I worked with some other people, and and for those, I read myself, and I thought that my voice would be good that I should use my own projective verse, you know, my own breath as the vehicle for sound, which was very interesting and beautiful. And I learned a lot about poetry through that. Um, and then I had the one about Ovid. There were numbers of different ones in between all these, but I had uh, the one about Ovid needed a soundtrack and I met an experiment, uh, electronic, I'm friends with, uh, a wonderful musician who lives in Berlin named Wiebke Tiarks. And I asked her, I commissioned her in a sense. I mean, I, we made a kind of, I didn't pay her that much. I don't think I could have at that point, but I gave her a gig and she wrote a soundtrack for me and we worked together and it was actually very wonderful and productive. And what I really wanna do is go back into that whole world and really make a whole new one. I wanna make one that's either about the awkward uncomfortableness of the body, or I kind of wanna make one that's about the golem. I'm not sure, I have a lot of ideas about future films, but I would definitely love to work with a musician and a composer and you know some kind of sound person, but I'd also like to maybe up my game a little bit. So I probably need to work with like some kind of film person too. I do everything by myself. I don't have a studio assistant who makes my paintings either. Anything I don't know how to do, I just do it badly. That's my principle. So um, I do it and try to not care. But I don't have anyone do any work for me. I don't believe in that, actually. I don't like it. I don't like it when other people do it, and I don't do it. So I do everything myself. I mean, I have a studio assistant who comes to help me with my taxes and help me with shipping and stuff, but nobody works on my work. Oh, you're muted, Will. Yeah, thanks. Sorry, we went from uh, six to 
uh, 30 or 40 questions. So I'm gonna try uh -oh. to sift through these um, and, and sort of curate, curate it for you all. And I'm sorry if I don't get to your question because there's probably not time for all of them. There's a, um, I'll try to group some. There's a, there's a, 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 a number of questions about uh, process and in, in your, in your own energy uh, as, a, as an artist in terms of, you know, how you start, how you maintain, um, uh, you know, uh, the same energy uh, when it comes from the smaller things so, and you transition to a larger thing um, or, um, and, and I guess generally sort of planning, um, um, looking at a blank canvas, how uh, your sort of approach. I, think that I don't know what I'm doing most of the time. Um, so really, honestly, I start the same way everyone does who doesn't know what else they're, doesn't, I'm not good at planning. I have an idea. This is just maybe my own wacky theory that there's painters and then there's drawers. And I feel like painters have like a picture. They have an overview, they've got a plan, they've got something they're going for. They know how to do it. They're good at design. They're good at implementation. They're good at all that. I am not good at that. I know for a fact that I'm a fantastic illustrator and a horrible designer. I don't have any overview. I basically work like a beaver, like building a beaver dam where like you put sticks together. I've told my class a million times that that's what we're doing when we have a crit. We're doing a verbal beaver dam. We're building a structure with what we've brought to add to the pile. So I feel like I don't, I'm very ethically and principally, how do you say it? I, I believe in the principles of improvisation. I think it's actually deeply important. I think that that partly comes from jazz music. I'm very aware of it as an inheritance from black American music in part, but the idea that you don't just come with your score and play your score and also, there are some other kinds of philosophical ideas about not splitting um, concept and production, you know, and I do not. So I believe that it's my responsibility to kind of give it my all every time out with everything I have. And I feel like that's what Charlie Parker did. And I feel like that's what Dinah Washington did. I, well, she sings songs that are scripted, but you know what I'm saying? I mean, I really believe in this idea that like, you need to walk on the wire. So I start with nothing and I start building up and drawing, but let's just say one thing. I also have a chronological life. So whatever I was thinking about, like I didn't know what to do during pandemic. So I painted flowers cause that's what there was. But then once I got a studio again and I started mucking around, it was clear that the stems were like people's legs. It was clear there was an anthropomorphic clue a way in and I think anthropomorphism is always my way in I start with the mess I look for the like clue or the signal in the in the signal to noise tapestry and then I usually go in through the window of like recognition of the personness of the beingness of the painting and then trying to go in there and flesh it out and pull it and push it and see what happened to it there's a wonderful question that might maybe follow up with that. Do you ever give up? Do you ever give up on a painting? Oh yeah. I throw away, I'd say a third. Like a third just don't make it. I'd say like a, a fifth are great out of the gate. Those are the lucky winners, the wonderful ones you live for. <laughs> Let's say there's 10 paintings, right? I make about 10 paintings a year. One is shit. I just literally get angry one day and trash it. I, I cut it up with a knife, with a razor blade. One is wonderful. It like is magic. It works right away. It's beautiful. It clicks. You come to a spiral, you come to a better place than you started, but you're still on the same train of thought. So it's like better. It's just beautiful how it unfolds. Um, that one stays. Usually I keep that one if I can. Then there's like three or four that are like, eh, they're okay. They're trying to get somewhere. They're getting out. They, I don't do another one. I, I, I really also don't, my students know this. I've told them this. I don't believe, I don't like shows where there's 20 things and they're all the same thing with 20 different colors. 
I just don't like that kind of, I'm not interested in, I'm not interested in production value, but I'm interested in process and process and production are very different. Process is when there's no end in sight. You're in it. It's kind of like being inside the, the, the stories in the Bible. They just keep unfolding. The people keep doing crazy shit. Everything keeps going wrong. Everyone's disappointed. Stuff happens. Then more stuff happens. Then more stuff happens. That's what it's like in the studio. So you kind of do bring along what happened in the last chapter. You kind of have that under your wing. And then a lot of things go horribly wrong. And you should throw them away. I really do not believe in making sale things out of junk. The question about abstraction, do you, does, do you, do you think it needs something uh, based in reality to, to, to have meaning, to, have, to, to make it meaningful? No, not at all. I think that the meaning is the history and development of that thing's coming to being and that that thing has to come to being however it comes like an Ed Clark painting. There was an Ed Clark painting that Ed Clark was the painter is one of my favorite painters. He's got the big brush stroke in the beginning of the improv section. He works with brooms, he works on the floor. He worked, he's now sadly gone, but he worked with dust and debris from the floor. He sweeps the paintings, he sprays them, pulls rags across them. That is the meaning, that's the meaning. And, and, and the phenomenological um, development of the thing is the story of the thing and is the meaning of the thing. But I'm a very heavy duty anthropomorphical reader. Like I'm always looking for little tidbits of like the story or the recognition factor. And so I feel like abstraction for me, like at one point during the talk, I said abstraction is an interruption that you can plop into the plot. I think it's the place where you can be silent I think it's the place where you can be free of the rules. I think it's the place where your body is gonna tell you what the next move is instead of your brain. But I also think it's the place that you can use both to figure out. You know, I think it's deeply important to both making the painting more problematic, making the story more problematic, making the recognition more problematic and also quieting the viewer, silencing you know, in a weird way, abstraction is demanding. And I want that demandingness to be built in. We can't just go in and go, there's the truck and there's the flower and there's the little man and there's the thing that tipped over. I get it, done, we're finished. We have to stick into the not knowing and try to understand the mystery of the thing inside of itself. Maybe it has core values you know, different, different people's abstraction has different core values. Do you know what I mean? Like each person uses abstraction as a different character. For me, it's the sort of trickster. It's the maker of difficulty. It's the bringer of, of, of silence and confusion and contradiction. That's what I use abstraction to mean. Oh, you're, you're off, you're muted. Sorry, I keep, keep doing that. Um, could you talk a little bit about the relationships of em, em, embodiment, movement, dance? Uh, I think this is connected to um, the, the, princ the principles. Um, yes. How they show up in your studio process. Oh. Well, I, mm, they're not in my studio practice. Dance is not in my studio practice. Um, it just isn't. Dance w was in my life in a really profound way because my first best friend that I moved to New York with was a, is a, is a, she no longer lives in New York, but her name, she's, her name is Donna Mandel. She's a wonderful person and she, I'm still friends with her. She lives in Chicago. We, I moved here from Chicago in 1975 and I was best friends with a dancer in high school and she ended up going to um, study with Merce and dance, you know, be involved in the dance world in New York in the 70s that was Trisha Brown and uh, 
I, I, I'm gonna blank out here because it's so many names, but like you guys know them, uh, Yvonne Rayner and Douglas Dunn and all these amazing uh, Judson Church dancers. So I went to a lot of those shows. I saw a lot of dance, a lot of modern dance and a lot of the dance that was being done then was, a, was built on principles that I'm also talking about in part, for instance, the idea of Yvonne Rayner's early dances that they're both very um, expert, but they're also very humble and normal kinds of behavior. It's like throwing a mattress or brushing your teeth or pushing your elbow or rolling over. It would, all the components were really low to the ground and normal kinds of thing, normal everyday movements built up into, into a, a, a sequence and a, and a set of proposals. And so I feel like that's how it works for me as a painter. These are very prosaic things. You know, I draw something, I erase it, I turn it over, I drip stuff on it, I do things to it and see what happens. And it's, that's the only way in which I'm related to dance. But because I had a great friend who was a dancer, I understood dance as a form that's not dissimilar from painting because dance is about shapes. And I'm obsessed with shapes. I think shapes are the most interesting things outside of colors and lines. So dance is all about assuming a shape. Um, I didn't get to show you as much as I would love to show you, but I was recently re-looking at this amazing contact improv guy named Ishmael Houston Jones. If you can ever go see an Ishmael Houston Jones dance performance on, or just look at it up on YouTube, you should look at it because all the politics and the trouble and the confusion and the struggle that I feel like is good about action painting, it's in his work as a dancer. So many great questions here, Amy. Um, there, uh, there's question, uh, um, maybe, maybe going from the, the idea of you just talking about shape, there are questions about, about the show you curated at, at MoMA and um, uh, about um, how that, um, your experience with it, one, and then as a, as, a, as a curatorial practice and thinking through a painter, thinking through a curatorial uh, form, and, and then also how that has sort of fed into your own practice or the experience of that fed into your own practice. Um, well, the, the last thing first I can say it's easy. Um, it was, it, it made my life more wonderful by far to have the incredible experience of being invited to go through MoMA's entire collection and take anything I want and put it, you know, in a room to try to, and then try to figure out um, how to make that look good. Um, and actually I should just say, Anything that wasn't in the show that you really wonder why didn't she put it in? Probably because I couldn't, I didn't, I actually couldn't have anything I wanted because a lot of the stuff um, that I picked was then already chosen for other people's, you know, the, the regular curators kind of opening MoMA shows. So I couldn't have anything that was already uh, earmarked for them. So I, I built my show out of other things, but um, it didn't, it didn't change my practice at all. It, it, um, it was completely commensurate with what I believe. All the things that I was talking about, they're all in that show. I could have just talked about the show, but I wanted to talk about it with a more, um, I don't know, from a more theoretical um, height of like belief. Um, but it was, a, it was just a deep, great, unbelievable pleasure and a huge thrill to work with two great people. I worked with Michelle Kuo, well, three, and. Temkin, Michelle Kuo, and, um, and Jenny, uh, Jenny, um, I, I worked with, I worked actually, and then there was Amy. I mean, I worked with a lot of people there and I feel terrible because I'm going to like, I'm going to screw it up. But um, I just want, I, 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 it was amazing to learn about their, the difference between how a curator thinks and how an artist thinks. Um, that was really educational. It was just an educational experience. It wasn't a studio practice experience. It didn't really affect me in my, in my studio practice. It just solidified my beliefs. Um, what, um, there was an earlier part of that question I, that, I, that I now 
I think I think you answered it. Um, it's more about what they what what your experience was um, approaching that as a being a painter approaching that you know a kind of curatorial uh, project. I mean, I if you if you, it's kind of not dissimilar from the like I talked a lot about. I didn't talk very much about my individual paintings and how they develop in this talk because you can't do everything. So instead I talked more about ways of staging and ways of deploying and ways of um, making meaning by putting things in rooms in public spaces and how you walk through them. In a way, I should have talked more about, I wish I could have talked more about the painting painting part of my practice but that part that was already very involved in display ideas and about how meaning comes is released through the body encounter, those things I already thought were part of my work. So I'm gonna to try to get to uh, more questions. And speaking of uh, uh, the painting uh, part of, um, of your practice. Um, co color is a, is a, there's a big, lots of questions about color, about how you approach color, um, uh, how you, how you think about it, how you use it, how you set up a palette, um, both, both process and sort of conceptually, what is color for you? What, what is it for me? What is it? How do you use it? How do you think? How do you think about color as a? Well, as a here's the thing. I've I've read about color, um, not just color theory. Like there's Goethe and there's Newton and there's color wheels and there's Albers and there's you know tons of books about color. There's digital color and there's lots of theories of of color. Also, there's you know. Uh, obviously a great deal to be said about the way color is deployed by different kinds of people and different kinds of colors of people and different cultures and different, you know, in different places. Um, so I, I think I've read a lot of those books because I was in a color reading group for years and we tried to really read as much as we could, like as we tried to read everything we could, you, you can never get to everything. And at the end of reading all of that, I realized that that didn't have any effect on my decisions about what colors to use in my studio. It didn't, color theory brought me no information that was useful as a painter whatsoever. Albers brought me great information because Albers is kind of not really theory in a sense. He's like pure practice. He's really relational. He really says like only, you can only see what the color is when you're by the thing that isn't that color. So all of the relationality of Albers was the most moving part of all the books that I read for the seven years that I read those books. Um, I'm sure there's new ones that will be published that I haven't gotten to yet. Like I wanted to read the book that just came out about the color brown by, um, uh, the guy who used to teach at NYU. But anyway, um, but that didn't have anything to do with my color practice because when I'd be in my studio, what I kind of noticed after years was that I gravitated to two kinds of colors that were always clashing. One was colors that were straight out of the tube and that were fast and furious and kind of gaudy and cheap and regular and un unmitigated that you could buy. And you know, like there's great pinks and weird greens and amazing see-through purples and insane yellows. And, you know, I have a whole color as a lecture that I've given a million times that is a lot about buying colors and how wonderful and how crazy and how kind of um, how much, it, how much the buying the color and going to the art supply store is, is about how you think about color. But then the other kind of color that I like is the kind that you scrape off. And I do ruin paintings. And this is partly like what I keep saying I didn't really get to talk about, but I go through endless destructions, layers and layers of the scrape down and the wash off and the, and the, and the smudge and the blur and all of that. Cause I still use oil painting. 
And all of that happens when you're dealing with oil painting and you're dealing with like removal as much as you're dealing with addition, which is what I do. I mostly work through negation. And so when you do that, you get buckets of gray and brown and, you know, green mud and maroon mud, you get really weird colors. And I love those colors. And I love to put those two kinds of palettes together. So a lot of my paintings are built from a combination of very clearly saturated, purchased, clean, untrammeled, wild color. And then this introduction of this, what I think of as being shadow. And I think it's about death. I actually think it's about confronting death and putting these two orders of things, these two registers of things together, one of which is really about building, building brightness, building flavor, building a kind of harmonic, you know, structure of difference and beauty. And the other part is about shadowing it down, graying it down, pulling it out, making it somber, making it feel tender, delicate, difficult, um, something that you really have to like get up in real life in person to see, to behold with your real body and your own eyes. And none of this comes through in, in, in Instagram, in Zoom, in slideshow, none of this. That's why like in a weird way, it's hard for me to even talk about my paintings on a Zoom thing. I'd rather just talk about display conditions because you can't see paintings in real life. But those dynamics of negation and, and of piercing the brightness with darkness and piercing the darkness with brightness, those are the dynamics that I'm trying to achieve when I work. And it's all done intuitively through kind of instinctual measurement. I need this and then I need the opposite and then I need a different thing and it's a dialectic. Uh, I think uh, we're at the end of our time. We're just we're okay. just up on eight o'clock, Amy. Um, thank you so much. It's been wonderful um, spending the semester with you, having conversations with you. I know the students love having you in class. Um, thank you for giving a wonderful lecture. And um, thank you again so much to everybody at Cooper, and especially you, Will, because you brought me, and I'm really grateful. And thank you. Yeah, and thanks to the audience. Thanks to everybody for coming. Thanks for and such, thanks to uh, everyone great for listening. Questions. Good night. Bye.